Welcome to English 3293, Modern American Literature. I'm your professor, uh, Dr. Guy Litton, and uh, I'm excited to be able to take this journey with you this summer. Hopefully everyone has read uh, the material that I sent to you by email, um, and also we're, hopefully you've been able to watch the overview video on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to be posting these class lectures on YouTube each Wednesday. That's the plan anyway, going forward. And all of the materials that you need, um, except for the textbooks, will be uh, located on Canvas or on this YouTube channel. So if you haven't done all that, please go back and do that real quick. Won't take very long to do that. Read the email and um, watch the overview video. But if you're prepared, then let us launch. We're going to be talking uh, with a couple of different videos for this first lecture. We're going to be uh, uh, covering uh, the material that we have with a couple of different videos, that is. And I'm going to give you an overview of, of what the semester entails in terms of our subject matter. Now, when we talk about modern American literature, what we're really talking about is literature after the Civil War. Most of us think that modern uh, means, you know, the last 20 or 30 years or so. But in fact, when you look at the history of a nation's um, literature or its culture, Modern depends on how old the country is, and the United States is not a terribly old country uh, compared to some of the others like Britain or France or China or, or Japan. Um, and so modern for us goes back 150 odd years. Uh, modern for the British would go all the way back to the Renaissance, the 1500s. So, uh, but what we mean by modern American literature is literature written after the Civil War, for the most part. We're going to be dealing with a couple of different movements. Movements are periods of time um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a culture's history where the art, literature, philosophy, music, all those kinds of things, the product of a culture, um, exhibit certain traits or tendencies. And movements come and movements go. We're going to be talking about two different movements here. Well, maybe three here. And, and uh, this is the first part of the of, of lecture one, uh, video one, and the second part is going to be posted separately. Okay, so be sure you watch both videos, all right? So the first thing we're going to talk about is this, the fact that uh, the United States prior to the Civil War was um, a country that had, was very young and as a result um, embraced a, a movement known as Romanticism. Now, you may have heard some things about Romanticism before. You may be familiar with some of the authors. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne is a famous author. There are several others. Emerson, Poe, um, uh, Frederick Douglass, Margaret Fuller, Henry David Thoreau, Melville, many, many others that, uh, that many of you may have come across before. Most people, when they think of Romanticism, they think of being romantic, as in lovey-dovey. But Romanticism, as a movement, uh, runs from about 1815 to about 1865 in the United States. It's later than it was in Europe, and, and, and the next movement will be later in the United States than it, is, than it was in Europe as well. Um, romantic literature tended to emphasize extreme individualism and self-exploration. If you look at all the great works by all the American Romantic writers, they are emphasizing individualism self-exploration. You look at Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on self-reliance. You look at uh, Henry David Thoreau's um, essay uh, known as Civil Disobedience or Walden. These are all works that are about the individual self-reliance, cultivating the individual's um, identity and uh, expressing that through action. There's an interest in the humanity's relationship with nature. And the notion that an early spiritual relationship, earlier spiritual relationship with nature needs to be restored. So there's a sense by the early 1800s, that's the period we're talking here, that, that human beings have sort of lost touch with nature. That we live in cities now, industrialization had started, at least in Europe, and we lost touch with the beauty of nature and that nature is kind of God's way, it's his canvas to bring us closer to him. So, so they really spiritualize nature. People still do that to a large extent. They, they, they see nature as something that they can, uh, go out into and get closer to God or get closer to their own spiritual identity. Um, and we get that from the romantics. The romantics are real believers that we've lost something. We have to get back in touch with that. And so also shouldn't be surprising. They also believe that one of the, one of life's purposes is spiritual regeneration, that we have to, to somehow develop ourselves spiritually by going back and reconnecting with the basics. Okay. Um, so, so their, their literature is really interested in about 
self-improvement, individualism, spiritual self-exploration, spiritual development, all of those things are really important. And they use symbolism and metaphor quite a bit in their literature to reflect the idea, deep thought here, that reality has multiple levels of meaning, which is to say that some things mean more than one thing. Some things represent more than one idea. Right. So that reality has multiple layers to it. Not that just here's a tree and it's just a tree. OK, here's a tree and it's a tree, but it's also sort of a symbol of life, of strength, of whatever. They read their natural world for things that are beyond just the surface material level. OK, um, and we're getting deep into this, I know, but you got to understand this to understand Romanticism, because we're not going to be doing Romanticism. We're going to be doing what comes after Romanticism, but you got to know what Romanticism is first. There is a belief in intuitive ways of knowing that we know things internally, not because we learn them in school, but that our heart, our spirit knows things. Because if it's in direct communication with the Godhead, then we, we, we can act. Some of us would call it conscience. Some of us would call it, you know, our heart, whatever you want to call it. But romantics are big believers in that. And, th and because of that, they validate emotive ways of knowing. Okay. Not just cognitive, not just logic, but feeling is a validation of truth. Okay. Feeling is a, va is a validation of truth. It's not the only way to know truth. Right? Logic is not dispensed with with the romantics, but logic has to be tempered with an emotional response which confirms truth. Um, there's also a, a, an interest in social political reform movements. Right? Um, you see this with other writers like Dickens, who are really interested in trying to champion um, those who are underprivileged or poverty. Um, the era of Romanticism is the era of abolitionism. It's where the women's rights movement was begun. It's where the temperance movement was begun. Uh, all of these kinds of things begin with the Romantics. Um, but they never sought a top-down answer to their problems. They would never have asked for government to step in and do things. They believed in individual reform, and that if we all collectively, individually changed our hearts and the way we perceived our fellow human beings, then societal uh, advancement is able to take place. So if the emphasis is on individual reform and individual responses to greater social problems, it shouldn't surprise you that the kind of literature that they produced would be lyric poetry. Lyric poetry is the kind of poetry that expresses the thoughts, feelings, and ideas of the individual writer. Essays and journal writing. These are very personal, reflective kinds of writing. And then also fiction that is really trying to gear the individual towards a change of heart, a change of sentiment. Okay. As such, you'll see the drama, we're not going to do any drama in the class, but uh, the, the drama of the 19th century, the 1800s, is melodrama, right? You and I might look at it and go, oh my gosh, those people down in the right-hand corner there, they're just swooning all over the place and overacting and whatnot. But they believed in that. They really thought that was moving and it would change people's lives and hearts. So so they, they really believed very strongly in um, literature that was what we call didactic didactic, meaning lesson teaching. So they believed in literature that would change the way you saw things, that had good outcomes, that, that, that affirmed the human spirit, that prompted you to do the right thing. Okay. Now this is all important. You need to hold this in your mind and come back to this if you need to, because I'm setting us up for the next era with these great writers and these great works with these sorts of emphases or characteristics right? The movement called Romanticism. We are, after the Civil War, going to get a different, a very different kind of movement. But we, we do have to talk about the Civil War itself, because I'm not doing a history lesson on the Civil War, but it is super important, because frankly, there is no more important historical event in the, in the history of our country than the Civil War. It changed who we are as a people. Of course, the Civil War began in 1861. It happened for lots and lots of different reasons. Of course, the primary reason was uh, for, for the war was slavery, um, but it happened as a result of a lot of different problems or events that just seemed to be put us on a collision course to it. So you get the Dred Scott decision where the Supreme Court says, no, slavery is totally legal. 
Well, okay, so there's not a legisl- there's not a uh, judicial answer to our problem here. The court won't step in and put a stop to slavery. The legislature, the Congress, was deadlocked on it. And then when Lincoln was elected as a person who wanted to eventually get rid of slavery, he was no great abolitionist at first. That's a fact. He, that grew on him during the war. Um, the South decided we're leaving. Um, and uh, you get all of these things, the Fugitive Slave Act, you can look all of this stuff up. It's not our job to do a history of the Civil War here, but just to realize that what we had in the country was a deadlock, and the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the executive branch couldn't provide an answer. We weren't able to do the one thing that Americans are generally pretty good at, and that is find a compromise, because there's really no compromise on an issue of whether or not this person over here is or is not a human being. This person over here does or does not have the same rights as others. Either you believe it or you don't believe it, and part of the country didn't, and part of the country did, and they had to fight it out. Um, And so the result of the war, right, happily, was the elimination of slavery, though not the elimination of discrimination, uh, and not certainly the fulfillment of of the the nation's promise in that regard to everybody, but it was a step, an important step, a tectonic shift in our values and our self-image. Because the war presented us with a couple of different problems. Problem A is that the United States always felt that it was on a mission to liberate humanity, that it was breaking away from Europe and the monarchies and this idea that some dude named King George or whoever it is can kick everybody around and no, we're not for that. We're in favor of everybody having rights and the government can't tell you what to do. Um, It can only tell you what to do when it's popularly elected. And so, but they hadn't really worked that whole idea about who gets to vote out. Uh, right? They just were on this hunch that, you know, we don't want one dude telling us what to do all the time, and we don't want his son or his son or, or, or his grandson or whatever to simply inherit. The government should answer to the people in some regard. Didn't quite work out who those people were yet, because if you were female or if you were a minority or if you were not a landholder in many cases, you didn't get to vote. But there was movement towards something that we would call enlightened democratic principles. But That movement at the beginning of the country's history um, was greeted with great fanfare. We are a people that have done something to move the human race forward in this regard. We're breaking away from old forms of government and old forms of aristocracy, and we're establishing a new government. And we're succeeding because, you know, God's on our side. And, you know, um, you know this is this is the destiny of humanity to grow more and more democratic and more and more prosperous and to, to advance in terms of our technology and science and everything. And that's what we're here for. That's what America is is great at. And we're still very proud of that. And we should be proud of that as a people, all of us, um, because it is a fabulous country. It's just that all of a sudden it becomes greater and greater um, uh, as a burden for us to realize in the 1830s and 40s and 50s and early 60s, certainly, that we never quite dealt with this question of slavery. It never was dealt with uh, at the beginning of the country. And this continued to build and build and build to a head. You know the story until, of course, people took up arms. And the problem with the Civil War, of course, in terms of national image or self-image is this. Um, at the end of the war or during, uh, during the middle of the war, people asked themselves, why is this happening to us? What, what, why are so many people dying? You know, wh- why are we having to go through this? What have we done? And, 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 and there were a lot of reasons why people felt that way. At the beginning of the war, both sides thought that the war was going to be really brief, like a couple of weeks, right? It, the Southerners said, why, we'll whip them Yankees. We, a good Southern boy can beat 10 Yankees with his hand tied behind his back, which was nonsense. They found that was they found out that wasn't true. And Northerners thought, well, we have superior technology and, and industry, and, you know, they'll give up soon. And that wasn't true. In fact, the only person who really had a proper understanding of how bad the war was going to be and how long it was going to last was William Tecumseh Sherman, who had lived in the South and worked with Southerners. He fought for the North, of course. And he realized early on, oh, no, this is going to be a terrible, long and bloody war and hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. In expressing that opinion to his friends at the outset of the war, his friends thought he was mentally ill and almost had him committed because everyone was was convinced that the war would not last long. And as it dragged on, and as people died in huge numbers, for example, the Battle of Shiloh in uh, in Tennessee, east uh, in West Tennessee, more people were wounded, killed, or or captured 
than the entire Battle of Waterloo. And that was a big battle, folks, with Napoleon. And after Shiloh, there were 17 more battles that big. More people were injured or died in one day at the Battle of Antietam than almost the entire Vietnam War. It was huge. The amount of carnage was tremendous. So much so that after the war, the state of Mississippi, the number one budget item for the state government in the state of Mississippi was artificial limbs. They spent more on artificial limbs than they spent on roads and bridges and education because so many people were wounded. Entire towns lost their entire population of young men. Counties were wiped out. Um, it was just the most devastating thing you can imagine. Imagine that you wake up one day, and it's not just a war in some other country, but out in your backyard, in your front yard, up and down your street, there are dead bodies of young men that you might know, that you grew up with, that you went to school with. This is just horrifically scarring. And it's natural for people to say, why is this happening to us? What have we done? And of course, the answer is provided in Lincoln's second inaugural when he says, we have to atone for the sin of slavery. This is the price we are paying because we did not do what we should have done early on. This is the price that we have to pay for the sin, our national sin of slavery, which will be washed away with the blood of these people after the war is over. So it's a vastly traumatic experience for these people. You and I cannot imagine it. We hope we never go through a thing like this again. But for, 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 for that generation, it just utterly changed who they are. Now, after the war, some really interesting things occur. First of all, most people don't realize this, but prior to the Civil War, people refer to the United States by saying the United States of America are a country. Today, we say the United States of America is a country. You say, well, what, what, what is that change and why was it made? It was made? It's a very important change because prior to the war, people thought of themselves as Texans or Missourians or Ohioans or New Yorkers first and Americans second. After the war, we thought of ourselves as Americans first, and we really still do. And in fact, um, it, in other words, it forged us and knitted us and stitched us together as a single people. Now, we face challenges, for sure, but we, we, we always think of ourselves as a single people. In fact, my, one of the things that's a great joy about my job is I get to take students overseas to, to Europe every year. And when you do, uh, you know, the Europe has a Europe, Europe has a European Union and different countries. They're good friends and gladly, uh, happily, they don't shoot at each other anymore, at least for a while. Um, but when you go to Europe, there's not a, there's not the same sense of camaraderie and, 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 you know, um, brotherhood and sisterhood as, as Americans have. You can always spot them. If you're an American and you're walking through, you know, the Forum in Rome or the Colosseum or the Eiffel Tower or visiting a museum and you run into another American, the first thing you do is just come up to them. Doesn't matter what their race is, re religion or whatever. You come up to them and start talking already. You know, hey, an American, blah, 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 blah. You start, I mean, you, you instantly recognize them as your countrymen. Um, in Europe, they kind of, sort of do, but an Austrian's not going to be buddy-buddy with a Slovakian. I mean, it's just not the same thing. Um, but in the United States, we have that sense of brotherhood and sisterhood that, that and of course, we'll always ask and tease each other about what part of the country you're from. You know, what, where are you from? California. Oh, California dude, eh? Um, or Texas. And, uh, when, we, when we go to Europe, the first thing people say is, where are you from? Texas. Now, oh, you ride a horse to school, right? Uh, so we have these sort of kind of regional identities, yes, but there's no doubt that everybody calling themselves an American, when you you're overseas, especially, other Americans will see you as their countrymen. And that's really not true for Europeans. So that, that didn't happen pr uh, prior to the Civil War, really. It really didn't, not to the same extent. So, so it forged us together. It made us a single people, which is terrific. But here's another thing that's very important. It fundamentally altered the culture and therefore the literature and art of the nation, because here's what ended up happening. You had an entire generation of young people who, when the war broke out, had really only lived in their hometowns, scattered all over the country. Some of them may have been African-American, some of them may have been white, some of them may have been any number of different, you know, um, Mexican-American, may have been any number. Of, but when the war comes along, it fundamentally changes the culture because so many people move around a lot. 
uh, people who, after the war, uh, decided to flee the South uh, because they were formerly enslaved and set up a new life somewhere else. Here in Texas, many of them. Um, and, uh, and, and they get to see a lot of the country when they do that. They've never been out of their hometowns. They see how big it is. They see its potential. They see how different people in different parts of the country are are from one another. You know, when I was growing up, my parents, uh, we watched a, 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 a cowboy movie once, right? And in the cowboy movie, there were African-American cowboys. And my parents said, this is crazy. There were no African-American cowboys. And I said, yes, there were. And they said, no, 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 there weren't. Um, because when they grew up, their image of cowboys was just white people, right? Well, if you do a little historical research, what you find is one out of three cowboys in Texas in particular and out west was an African-American young man who was escaping the oppressive nature of the Deep South, going out west, trying to make his way, sending money back to his family, what have you, as a cowpoke, right? So, in fact, the images they got were very different from the reality of history. And the history was, you know, about a third of the cowboys out in Texas and out west were African-American. And they moved from the Deep South to the West, and it changed their perspective. It changed what they learned about the country. They got out and looked at the big, wide world and the big, bright, wide prairies, and you had people from up north coming down south and then down south going up north and settling out west. So it was a population on the move, and as they moved, they saw what was out there. Everything from the National Parks Movement to preserve some of these great, beautiful places to finding out about people's different accents and their foods and all this stuff. So we were beginning to discover who we were and where we were. Right. And so that's huge. And it changed the culture. It changed the literature and art as a result, because the literature and art are going to reflect these things. But it also changed the, the, the psychology of that generation. Writers like Samuel Clemens, otherwise known as Mark Twain, William Dean Howells, Henry James, um, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, uh, Sarah Orne Jewett, a lot of these different folks who began writing literature a different way. They weren't the romantics that their parents were. They, they rejected, not exactly rejected, but challenged or questioned the assumptions of that romantic generation. So in other words, they're going to seek literature that doesn't have a preset answer to life's problems. That's a probably less emotive and more detached and objective. And, 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 and it's going to be a very different kind of literature. Many of these people, when they were young, were newspaper people. And so they reported things that they saw as they saw it. That will affect them when they become writers of fiction, nonfiction, prose, poetry, all of that sort of thing. They will carry with them the experiences of the war, how the war changed the culture, and the very approach to writing literature will change as a result of their experiences of the war. So I can't underestimate or can't miss, uh, um, uh, sell short, that is, the effect that the war had on this next movement, which we'll talk about in the next video. Okay, so part two, click on over when you're ready and watch it.